Good morning. Uh, we're diving into 1 Corinthians chapter 9 today. And this chapter, a bit longer than the one we looked at last week, but it's really continuing that discussion there from the previous chapter, chapter 8, in which Paul, if you remember, was asking the Corinthians to set aside their personal rights in favor of their ministry to one another and their love of the Lord. The difference here in this chapter is that Paul is now using an example from his own life and ministry to demonstrate why it is so crucial, so important, and so valuable to truly set our rights aside in favor of what the Lord has called us to and what we are to live for each and every day in Him. So let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 9. It's 27 verses, so it'll take us a couple moments, but here we go. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we had sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? that in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? but only one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all these things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Let's pray and thank God for his word. Lord, we thank you for your word. 
We thank you that your word is indeed truth, that your word calls us to the salvation that you have set before us. And as those who have been saved by your grace, it calls us to the life, to the race that you have called us to run. Will remind us today that the life you've called us to is not a race that we run, a life that we live on the basis of our own strength or power, but it is a life of surrender to you for your name's sake and your purposes of salvation in the lives of others. Remind us of the blessings of your gospel, your good news of salvation. May we not take you or what you have given us for granted. But may our hearts be full of thanksgiving that we would surrender in faith to you and be the servants you have called us to be. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, Paul begins his personal illustration here by asking four questions, defending the legitimacy of the fact that he is indeed a follower of Christ and called by the Lord as an apostle. These questions weren't necessarily meant to challenge anything, although they were defending his calling, but they really just served to set up the point that Paul was preparing to make. You remember the story of Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9, when he was still known as Saul, and he was traveling to Damascus as a Pharisee to arrest Christians there, only then to be personally interrupted by Jesus on the road, Paul then realized he had been wrong. He surrendered himself to Christ. He was ultimately baptized by a man named Ananias, and he was called by the Lord to be an apostle and a witness, particularly to the Gentiles. And this calling as an apostle came with much suffering and much responsibility. But it also came with a certain authority in Christ. The apostles were the central leaders of the early church, upon which the church was first built. It was their personal eyewitness testimonies about Jesus that really formed the foundation of the New Testament scriptures and the gospel message. Thus, Paul also had a certain authority in the church that not all believers had, and no current believer has, as the mission and ministry of apostles, as direct personal eyewitnesses of Jesus and his ministry, is not something that even could continue beyond the lives of those who actually encountered and interacted with Jesus there in the first century. But we have the word of God today. But Paul continues here in his point that as an apostle and a leader and minister in the church, he had the right to ask the church for support, for food and drink from the congregations that he served. He also had the right to have a wife, he didn't necessarily have to work as a tent maker to meet his own basic needs. He could have rightfully expected the church to support him and his family, just as a soldier does not pay his own way to go to war, or a farmer doesn't refuse to eat from his own vineyard, or a shepherd drink the milk from his own flocks. Paul argues uh, that this isn't just his own idea or some idea of men, but that this notion that those who proclaim the gospel, have a right to be supported in and through their ministries, is seen going all the way back to the law of Moses. Not only was it clearly seen in the temple, as the priests and the Levites received portions of the meat and grain offerings to provide food for their families, but God had even supported this decree here, Paul says, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, when God commanded the Israelites you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. In other words, the ox, an animal and a beast of burden, should not be kept from eating some of the very grain it was treading. And if God cared enough about your ox to give a command to ensure you did not mistreat it, but allowed it the freedom to feed, then does not God care much more for his people and those who proclaim his word? You know, we find in various early church documents that from the get-go, churches were supporting those who ministered and preached in the congregation. One such document, known as the Didache, mentions that men who served in this way regularly in the congregation were to be given meat, but traveling preachers who were just passing through, maybe say on a missionary journey, 
were just to be given bread. This suggestion likely developed because there were probably some men claiming to be preachers or missionaries going town to town who maybe weren't as genuine as they claimed, whereas the character of a man who lived and served in the community should have been known by the congregation. Anyway, this practice of supporting pastors, preachers, ministers, missionaries is something the church has continued since its inception, providing and supporting in whatever means made most practical sense at the time uh, the needs of those who lead and serve. And I want to say I can't appreciate enough the support I've found here in, in this church where I'm at, as this church has always faithfully taken care of me and my family over the years when we've had needs. Uh, and I, I simply want to say thank you. I, I, I am not in need of anything. And I praise the Lord for his grace um, and the many friends and support that I have here. But I want to emphasize, you see, the point of this passage, the point of this chapter, the goal that Paul is making isn't you should support your pastor. In fact, even though Paul spends the first 14 verses establishing this and really arguing why this is right and good, Paul's real desire is to remind the Corinthians that this right to ask support of the church wasn't something that he and Barnabas had elected to do. The other apostles, including Peter, who's called by his Greek name Cephas here, they were supported by the church. Peter had a wife. Peter didn't have to go find another job to ensure that he and his family could eat. And yet here Paul remained single. He did not ask the church he went to for, for money or support, but instead he spent extra time working and laboring so that he could buy food for himself when he needed it. Remember what I said at the outset. Paul is continuing the discussion from the previous chapter. And remember when we examined that passage last week, Paul was explaining to the Corinthians why they shouldn't eat meat sacrificed to idols and why they should set aside their right to do certain things for the sake of the gospel and Christ's work in the lives of others. And here, Paul is giving a pretty big example from his own life where he has done the same. In fact, arguably, Paul forfeiting regular financial support from the church was quite a larger sacrifice than passing on the opportunity to buy some meat at a possibly discounted rate. Yet Paul was careful to emphasize he wasn't asking for that kind of support in this letter. On the contrary, the last thing he wanted was that support. And while his refusal to accept support from the congregation potentially gave him grounds for boasting before men, on the basis of his very calling to preach the gospel, he had no grounds for boasting, not in any way. Paul understood that he was who he was in every way only because of the grace of God found in Jesus Christ. Apart from the love and grace that Christ had shown to him, Paul deeply understood that he had nothing. The gospel of God's grace, life, and salvation was in every way Paul's life. His reason for living, his passion, his motivation. Paul couldn't even comprehend a scenario where he wouldn't preach the gospel. Meaning, what did he have? What could he do other than preach the gospel? His calling was from God. Should he deny or refuse his maker and savior? For even as Paul explains in verse 17, even if it isn't his will to do this, meaning even if he decides he doesn't want to preach the gospel anymore, how could he stop? For he has still been entrusted with this calling, this responsibility, this stewardship of the gospel from the Lord. So even if he was doing so begrudgingly, he still couldn't stop proclaiming this good news. For the gospel in and of itself is the means of Paul's life and the end of Paul's life. The gospel wasn't just something he, he shared. It wasn't just a message or story he told. The hope and salvation of the gospel was and is the very reward of his life and the fruit of his ministry. There was nothing more for him to long for. Nothing better he could receive 
than the redemption that Christ's blood had bought for him and the home and glory that Christ had prepared for him. Thus it seems here as if it truly brought Paul joy to know that he was able to proclaim this gospel, this good news that had saved him, free of charge, meaning without the need of support from those to whom he preached. But instead, to simply offer it freely to others, just as Christ had so freely offered it to him. For in Christ, Paul already was free, just as we have all been free through Christ, set free from sin in this world and equipped by the Holy Spirit to truly live for our Savior. Yet this freedom wasn't given to us so that we could abuse it, misuse it, or bring glory to ourselves. We've been set free for a purpose, and that purpose is most clearly seen in our service to others for the sake of the gospel. Because our very salvation, the very nature of it, calls us to surrender ourselves in service, to set aside our own passions and desires in favor of the calling we have been given. Paul is clear here. He was a free man. He was not a slave to anyone. He did not have to conform himself to anyone else's preferences or desires for him. Nevertheless, Paul had voluntarily made himself a servant to everyone and anyone he encountered. He gladly gave up his rights to his own preferences in order to serve others, that through this service he may win as many as possible to Jesus Christ. The desire to see others come to know Jesus, to have their sins forgiven, their hearts healed, their minds renewed, and their life redeemed in full, completely overrode any personal desire that Paul may have had to assert his own individual rights to himself. If Paul was around Jews, then he lived like a Jew. He knew he didn't have to follow the law, that Jesus had already fulfilled it in full, yet when he was in Jerusalem, he followed the law anyway, in order that his service and witness to the Jews would not be hindered. But when Paul was around the Gentiles, he did not follow the law of Moses. Certainly he continued to live in obedience to Christ, but he set aside any Jewish custom that may have gotten in the way of his service to the Gentiles and his witness of the gospel to them. If he was with those who were weak, likely a reference to those mentioned in the previous chapter who were still weak in their faith and had much to learn, then Paul says here he met them where they were at. He didn't talk down to them or speak condescendingly to others. He became, in a sense, weak so as to relate to them and help them grow. For as he says at the end of verse 22 there, I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. Church, there is simply nothing greater, nothing more significant, nothing more wonderful than a person surrendering their life to Jesus Christ in faith, trusting in his grace, being brought into a friendship with God, and thus receiving eternal life in all its fullness. As Paul says, I, I do it all for the sake of the gospel. Because of the blessing of the saving work of the gospel itself is worth far more than everything in this world. Remember what Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, where he asked, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Far too often, church, we take the simple saving good news of the gospel for granted, and we dismiss its blessings in favor of far lesser ones. But to truly prioritize the good news of Jesus Christ above all else will always lead us to surrender ourselves for our Lord for the sake of service, ministry, and witness to others, putting the love of our Savior before any rights or preferences of our own, that we might be a servant to all, just as Christ came to be a servant for us. You see, this is the race we have been called to run. Much is often made of Paul's closing words here in this chapter, and for good reason. They challenge us to consider just exactly what we are living for, and just exactly which race in life we are running and why. 
But the discipline that scripture refers to here, the self-control that we are called to have, is the discipline of surrender unto service. It's not a discipline that seeks to craft ourselves into the most impressive religious or spiritual specimen possible in this world. Remember, Paul had already strived for that as a Pharisee, and he knew the fallacies of such a false race all too well. <laughs> no, it's the discipline of surrender, of setting aside ourselves, of taking up our cross, of belonging to our Master and Lord, that we might serve as he served, putting others before ourselves in all service, love, and care for the sake of the salvation that only Jesus Christ can bring to them. For I assure you, if you seek to serve others in this way, on the basis of your own energy, your own strength, your own patience, and your own will, then you will burn out faster than a match. It is only when we continually surrender in the faith to the Lord that we will find what we need to be the servants of the gospel that he has called us to be. As you see, true service to others for the gospel comes only through the surrender of ourselves to Jesus Christ. Because this race we have been called to run is not a race we can run on our own. It's a race that we are completely dependent upon Christ to run faithfully day in and day out, moment by moment. It's a race of service for the sake of the gospel, of setting ourselves aside that Christ would be magnified, that his good news would be made known, that the Spirit would convict others of their sin and their need for Jesus, and that they would come to know him personally. And you see, true surrender to Christ should always lead to Christ-like service. Because this is what Christ did for us. Remember, he came to die for us. He set himself aside. He said in the garden, not my will, but your will be done, speaking to his Father. He gave it all up for us. He came to serve us that we might be saved. So if we are surrendering to Christ, if we are aligning our life and our will and our being with him, if we are denying ourselves and taking up our cross just as scripture calls us to, then we are surrendering ourselves to Christ in a life of service to others for his name's sake. Surrender always leads to service. Are you surrendering to Christ? Are you surrendering your life to him? Are you truly setting yourself aside? Or are you still insisting on your own rights before all else? Are your preferences and your desires and your worldly ambitions more important than what Christ has saved you for? Let us be a people that surrender ourselves and serve one another that the name of Christ would be glorified and honored among us and through us. What a good God we serve. Let's pray. Lord, your many blessings are beyond our comprehension. But none is greater than the salvation you have given us and all that comes with it. What a life, what a grace you have bestowed upon us. What an incredible thing that you have come to make your home with us and gone to prepare a place that we will be at home with you forever. May we take none of this for granted. May our hearts be set in surrender before you and upon you, that we would fully depend upon you, that we would not allow our rights to get in the way of our surrender and service. May the world see our service to one another for your name's sake, and may they see your greatness, your goodness, your gospel, Lord. Lord, I pray for all those listening right now, and if they don't know you as Savior and Lord, I pray that they would come to know you, that they would acknowledge their sin, their need for your grace, and they would simply talk to you and trust you in faith, believing in their heart, confessing with their mouth that you and you alone are Lord and Savior. For those who do know you, God, I pray that they would continue to live in this place of surrender and faith. 
Lord, that we would not let anything come before our relationship with you. Thank you for your grace, Jesus. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Go in the grace and peace of Christ, surrendering to him and serving others this week.